Hello, Felix. How are you? Very good to see you. Very good to see you as well. Yesterday you were here in the office and now we're going to do this online. So where are you at right now? I'm in Amsterdam currently. Amsterdam. Well, same as I am. I'm also in Amsterdam. Good to have you with us um, again. Yesterday we made a podcast that was totally in Dutch. Now we're going to do it in English, I guess. I, uh, I have an English presentation prepared for you. Exactly. That's right. Uh, can you share your screen with us? Absolutely. Give me one second. So we're going to talk about is there really a healthy building without a healthy air? Um, yeah, that's what I see right now. So that looks very good. Great. Uh, Do you see, see my it, full yeah, screen? It is in presentation mode. It's not full screen. Wait, give me one second. Then I'm going to switch it around. And now it should be better. Yes, now it is better. Yeah, that looks great. So I would like to give you the floor. And when you're ready um, um, uh, or ready with your presentation, I will be back and ask you some questions. So uh, good luck. Sure, let's get started. Hello, everyone. Thank you for tuning in here today. And Wouter, of course, thank you very much for inviting me to uh, to give this session. My name is Felix van der Norst. I'm the co-founder and CEO at Clarify. And today I want to discuss with you, is there really a healthy building without healthy air? So let's first jump into what a healthy building exactly is. A healthy building is uh, constructed by 10 different pillars. So you have water, nutrition, light, community, mind, movement, materials, sound, thermal comfort, and air quality. Among these uh, different uh, factors that make up the healthy building, a lot of them are addressed by, for example, the tenants with the catering, uh, mind and movement, is there a community built around it? And obviously, there are also a lot of factors in play that really have to do with the construction of the building. And I would like to zoom in on one specifically, which is air quality. Now, it doesn't come probably to a surprise uh, for most of you people here, because a lot of buildings uh, really can have an effect on our performance and focus in day-to-day uh, -day work. Um, and our general life. This could have been me, but easily also one of the other clients that I've spoken um, that faces the issues of air quality on a daily basis. It can have a drastic influence on the performance, the well-being uh, when we are in a space in both the short term and the long term. And of course, also a satisfaction. How do we feel at the end of the day? Do we feel accomplished when um, we, we walk out of the office and do we feel like we actually went to a space that contributes to our productivity, right? Like how does it affect our mindset as well? So the thing is we spend 90% of our time indoors. And that means that by the time that we are 80, we spent roughly 72 years inside. And of these 72 years, we spent on average 36 years at work, which is half of the time that uh, that we live inside a building and the question is really like how does that affect us because up to 30 percent of buildings can actually make us sick and to put that even into more perspective we breathe 11,000 liters of air per day or roughly 2,000 gallons and that's enough to fill a swimming pool so if we think about how much air we breathe how does the environment that we are in actually have an effect on us, both in the short term or in the long term? How does it translate to having headaches or fatigue or just not feeling motivated when you're in your job? Or can it have like uh, an impact on you when you look at cardiovascular diseases or your, your the health of your lungs over time? A lot of factors are related to indoor air quality and therefore it's quite an invisible problem because we literally cannot see it most of the time, except of course, when there's smoke coming out uh, out of a building and we see it absolutely super clear. But the thing is here that the person who manages your building has a bigger impact on your health than your doctor. And this person just may have as big an impact on your bottom line as your CFO. And that's not me who's making this up. No, this is researchers from Harvard that put it in a perspective like this. So if we look at it this way, it really becomes abundantly clear that the indoor air quality touches many facets of um, our personal life, our health and well-being, the company's performance over time, as well as the building value. And it has a lot of touch points. So why don't we go in a little deeper in this conversation? So 
when we look further at the tenant's perspective, what are some of the implications that we see? Um, the cognitive functioning, so the performance of your brains can be 50% lower in buildings with poor indoor air quality in comparison to buildings that actually have state-of-the-art ventilation in them and continuously improve the air quality throughout the day. Well, that um, is quite massive potential, but also substantial loss, if you look at it differently, to the current situation that a lot of companies can be in. And that loss is estimated as annual productivity loss per FTE, which uh, accrues to about 6,000 euros or roughly $6,000 annually. And on top of that, COVID, of course, also had a huge influence on how we look at going back to the office and how do we look at the role of our employers um, when we go and enter these buildings. And Honeywell did a very interesting survey about that also last year, which indicated that in over 3,000 uh, people that they've interviewed in, in, in all different continents in companies larger than 500 employees, they saw that 62% of FTE would leave their job if their employer does not take measures into account to create a healthier work environment. So also when you look at it from um, attracting talent and retaining talent, it becomes more and more of a hot topic to make sure that the workplace is really supporting our health and well-being, and especially our quality. So to me, this light bulb went on a couple of years ago when I encountered this problem myself in university and was literally one of the students that was laying with his head in his arms uh, in, the, in the lecture rooms because of this exact problem. But if we look at light on itself, it's only been introduced quite recent, uh, recently in the total history of, of uh, how we live in buildings. It's been about 100 years ago that we introduced lights into a building. And before that, nobody could ever imagine how electricity would be included as a standard inside buildings, whether we buy them, whether we rent them. It was unheard of. Now, if we go to a place and it doesn't include electricity to, uh, uh, to, to hang up a light bulb, or if it doesn't have light when you enter into an office space, we, th we think we would be crazy to, to rent uh, a space like that, right? So the mindset really shifted that way. But and, and, and if you look at it then from like a point of ESG, it also becomes inevitably clear that indoor air quality is becoming essential. Because Natalie Paladichev, the president and CIO of Ivano Cambridge, one of the largest asset management funds in the world located in Canada, stated that nobody is going to buy a building where you cannot guarantee the quality of the air, especially after the pandemic. All these factors will be part of the new normal. So how is this um, paradigm shift in the way that we think now changing the way that we operate in real estate? A couple of drivers come into play. So why now? The first one is obviously the ESG transition. Um, we went in the real estate sector quite some time ago already to look uh, and, and crunch the numbers on how we can improve uh, um, our environmental, uh, environmental metrics. It took us about 10 years to collect, analyze, and report on the environmental data. And now because of COVID and the drastic um, uh, change to how we look at offices, it becomes more and more um, inevitable to start looking also at the S, how our health and well-being becoming a more central part of this picture and how this objective data uh, support company decision-making and compliance reporting. Well, the change that occur occurred obviously is supported by some legal frameworks. So to touch some points in Europe, you have the CSRD from the tenant's perspective, from from the owner's perspective, it's the EU taxonomy, the energy performance building directive, sustainable uh, finance disclosure reporting, and more and more. This led to, in first instance, look at emission scopes, make them clear, define them well, and tackle them. But it also puts a continuous pressure on building insights, where not only sustainability becomes the cornerstone, but also the demand for green, healthier buildings rises. And obviously, if you don't go with this flow, there are along the way legal and financial risks that are uh, inevitably occurring. So this push is moving forward at a steady pace. Now, the problems that have been becoming more uh, drastic recently in the light of COVID is that a lot of people find 
comfort at home. A lot of comfort is coming from the feeling of health and well-being, doing it at your own pace, being in an environment that you really like, and not in an office that might not have the right facilities for you to work properly, that um, has been annoying because it was always too warm or too cold, or there was a lot of wind chill in the office, or it was just that you came home every day with headaches from work and felt like you were that unproductive. That can occur, occur, of course, once, or it can occur twice when you have to go home, uh, go to the office post-pandemic. But when it happens three or four times, you really start to think, like, can I not work better elsewhere? So then the, 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 the whole question starts to appear to the surface. How can we make um, offices a more, uh, in, a, 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 give them a better role in society uh, post-lockdowns? And there we see that there's just a drastic um, spike down when uh, we look at the occupancy rates. It's still 60% lower on average and maybe even 70 in certain regions and countries um, in respect to how it was prior to the pandemic. And in addition to that, about 33% of office buildings is at risk of becoming obsolete. These buildings simply become outdated because, like I stated, tenants don't want to return to them because they're uncomfortable or they're not sustainable and don't address the needs of the tenants and their ESG-related goals. Um, and there's been a lot of coverage about this in the news. So why don't we act more on it? Well, one big example that we can give here is the, the 909 Chestnut in St. Louis. It was a building that uh, originally uh, was designed for AT&T. It has about uh, 1 million uh, square meters, uh, 1.4 million square meters, of roughly 130,000 uh, square meters of office space. It was designed for AT&T, but um, it, the original selling price in 2006 was um, around $205 million. Uh, uh, it was valuation, its valuation in 2014 was $207 million, um, which was when there was a contract in place also with AT&T, but they um, went out, even though the, list, uh, the lease was still continuing uh, along the way of 2017. And what happened was they couldn't fill the building and there were mergers and acquisitions to lead prior to this uh, uh, that, they, that they wanted to relocate, but also because the building couldn't meet uh, the standards that they were expecting. And what you saw was that the valuation in 2021, when Colliers was trying to sell it to the market, was so, so low that it hit the point of $9.2 million. Uh, and at that point, the building lost close to 96% of its value. So how can we make sure that not more of these cases occur and not more of these buildings become obsolete? The win-wins are more focused towards healthy buildings for that reason. So when we look at healthy buildings, there are a couple of ways to address value, both to the, from the funds perspective, when we look at landlords and the investors that are backing them, with tools like GRASP as a benchmarking tool, or BREEAM and WELL to put the certification standards to the building, so at least the tenants also know and the investors also know that there's a certain quality to it when you look at sustainability, but also when you look at health, uh, the healthiness of the building, like how good is it to the tenants' health and well-being when they reside in these buildings? And the tenants are willing to pay quite a big premium for that. When we look at Amsterdam, for example, one of the hottest um, real estate markets in Europe, the rental premium for sustainable buildings is 26% higher to equal buildings with do not hold up to the standards of, for, of, for example, Bream and Well. But also when you look at it from a maintenance perspective, it saves 28 euros per square meter on a 10-year net, uh, net present value analysis. And then Knight Frank also put it into a perspective that if you are trying to sell a building, the premiums for selling sustainable, healthy buildings are 8 to 18% higher in the city of London. So the numbers are really there. And yes, they will pay, but only if they can feel the difference, only if they can experience the difference, and only if their performance and well-being improves. And then, of course, I'm talking about the tenants. And that's why indoor air quality is a central starting point. So there are three steps in that sense to get started. And we made a framework for this from Clarify's perspective to 
save time, money, and improve efficiency in the process for real estate investors in, for example, the designing phase of retrofitting buildings um, and renovation projects. And it starts with mapping the current building performance with air quality audits. How do you make sure that the current uh, functionality of the HVAC system has not certain hotspots in certain areas and that it's in, uh, that it's working steadily across the whole building or that you can isolate certain areas to make sure that you're not in a renovation project spend too much on renovating everything because it's only um, a certain department that needs to have replacements right another thing that comes forth from this is of course strategic planning on how to improve the technical performance of hvac systems to make sure that uh, the heating the ventilation and the cooling are up to standards for better thermal comfort and improved experience of the indoor air quality and then when that all happens you can also of course alter also introduce iot based solutions for optimizing the performance and the tenant experience across the whole life cycle of the building and make sure that you have a continuous standard that you can live up to and control in real time so just to recap here air quality is the cornerstone of healthy buildings it is fundamental to tenant experience healthy buildings increase the productivity of the organizations that are residing in them and they increase the building valuations for the landlords and the asset managers that own them. Thank you very much for um, joining my presentation. And I'm very interested and happy to connect and, and learn more about your situations and stories. So if you have any questions, feel free to reach out. My email is here. My phone number is here. And of course, you can also scan the QR code and find us on LinkedIn. Wouter, thank you once again for uh, allowing me to present here today. And I'm looking forward to answer any questions. Walter, are you still there? <laughs> working. My mouse is not working with me, but now it is. I clicked already a couple of times on it, but it's back. Um, yeah, great presentation. Thank you, uh, Felix. Um, how do you see real estate adapting these kind of uh, change in mindset that you talked about? Yeah, I, I, I think uh, Anthony Slumbers was the one to call it um, very well in one of his blogs that I read and he said that the, the real estate market has obviously always been about money and it's always been about transactional value. But what is value if you cannot um, convert it into a transaction? What if buildings therefore become illiquid on the market? Well, then you have a serious problem when you look at it from an investing point of view. And if the changes in the market from a tenant's perspective drive also the valuation um, towards yeah, lending these buildings and others that are, like I stated, become completely obsolete, then um, it becomes quite an in inevitable force to, 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 um, to put more emphasis and focus on, on creating these healthier buildings. So yeah. I think it always comes down to the bottom line and it always has to make sense from a financial uh, aspect. And I think there are two key drivers. It's either avoiding this risk, just making sure that your risk adjusts return stays well and it's addressing new value because if you can be like one of the more pioneers in this market and really put yourself out there on the front um i think there is a very uh, nice uh, market um uh, share to 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 take there as well yeah yeah cool yeah i totally agree with you um um so yeah you're very happy to uh, to to share your insights with us um uh, where are you active right now only in the netherlands no, we work on a European level. Um, so if there are any uh, require, uh, inquiries from com uh, companies uh, nearby, um, we're happily uh, addressing them as well. We're also uh, working in the in the UK, uh, trying to uh, to get feet on the ground there as well. Um, yeah, so we're, we're now in a, in a scaling and expanding phase. Nice. Well, if we ever can help you, uh, you know, uh, we're here to help you out as much as possible. And for sure, uh, like yesterday, we have a whole list of companies that we're going to introduce you to. So uh, let's see what comes out of that. And yeah, for the rest, I wish you a, a happy day. Likewise, Wouter. Thank and you. A healthy day, of course. A healthy day. Let's keep <laughs> that in. <laughs> well, thank you very much, Felix. And speak to you soon.